Hello, everyone. As people are filing in to the meeting here, I wanted to welcome everyone to the Falmouth Art Center's second virtual art reception. <laughs> Great to see so many familiar faces and new friends on this particular Zoom reception. I'm Laura Reckford, Executive Director of the Falmouth Art Center. We have a terrific program this afternoon. There are several people who signed up who cannot attend. And so I wanted to make the announcement that we are recording this session and we'll send it to those people who could not make it. Before we start, some Zoom tips for all of you. Many of you know these things already, but for those of you new to Zoom, please mute yourself or we will mute you. We have the capability to do that. And unless you have a question, and so we'll call for questions um, at the end of each presentation, and then you can feel free to ask your question. If you think of a question while the artist is in their presentation, if you could go ahead and put it in the chat, then we can go, we can go ahead and ask that question uh, when there is a time after the presentation. Um, you might want to use the speaker view on your Zoom screen. That's a toggle switch that's typically in the upper left or the upper right um, of your Zoom screen, depending on what your device is. If you use the speaker view, you'll be able to see the artist in the large screen when they're giving the tours of their studio. That will be helpful to you. Now, when we share the screen, you will see the speaker in a small box and you can control on your Zoom screen whether you see additional boxes. And the way you do that, there's a little, you'll see a horizontal line above the little boxes during the shared screen time. And you can click on that to just see the shared screen and nothing else. Or there's a little one box, a little two box, you can click any of those so you can control what you see there. You can also move all those little boxes um, by grabbing them above the boxes and move it to the other side of the screen or above the screen if you like. So you do control that on your own screen on Zoom. A few announcements. Our next art talk is on Thursday, October 29th in a couple of weeks at 6 p.m. Dr. Sandy Feyman Silva will speak about Day of the Dead holidays in various cultures. And you can sign up on our website for this. Uh, falmouthart.org. And this is part of our new diversity and inclusion initiatives, which you'll be seeing throughout the year. We have four calls for art on our website right now, which is unusual. We might ha usually have one or two. We have four right now. We have a mask exhibit coming up, a voting exhibit, which is a collaboration with the League of Women Voters of Falmouth, an abstract art exhibit, that's a juried show, and a Falmouth art Art Center members exhibit that we're having at the Cape Museum of Art in Dennis. So information on all of these is on our website and we hope you'll participate. Also another announcement, our next class session starts on October 26th and we do have classes on Zoom and in person, painting, weaving, clay, adults, kids, all of that you can find on our website. And just so people know, we are open seven days a week and we are free to enter with three galleries to see at all times, 36 shows a year. Right now you can see our autumn juried show, which we're really going to talk a lot about on this art reception. The Upper Cape Camera Club show with photos of boats and local harbors and a collage show with work by Christine Weisinger and Thalia Veros. So those are the shows that are up right now. And now to the main event, here's what's on the agenda today. We're going to start with hearing from Jackie Reeves and I'll talk to Jackie about her experience during the autumn juried show. And Jackie will show us her work in the show. We always have a piece from the juror in every show and she'll also tour us around her studio. Then we'll go to Betsy Payne Cook who is an artist and a very popular teacher here at the Falmouth Art Center. And she'll show us her studio and also we'll look at her pastel piece that's in the current juried show. And then we'll go on to Andrea Moore, an artist and art educator who will show a PowerPoint about her work in the autumn juried show and also her studio. And as I said, if you have a question during the presentations, use the chat button rather than interrupting. And after each presentation, I will ask for questions as well. 
So without further ado, we'll bring in Jackie Reeves. Many of you will know Jackie's work as she is an artist and teacher very actively involved in the art scene here on Cape Cod. This weekend, she was actually here in Falmouth at Peg Noonan Park, helping to paint a mural she designed for the League of Women Voters of Falmouth. Born and raised in Montreal, she has spent her career delving into various art forms, including mural art, theater set design and painting, community arts events, and art education. Jackie studied painting at Massachusetts College of Art and Design and design art at Concordia University in Montreal. Jackie's award-winning art has been collected internationally and exhibited throughout New England museums, art centers, and galleries. She offers painting, drawing, and collage classes and workshops throughout Cape Cod, and has shared her professional experience as an artist and educator through panel discussions, podcasts, presentations, and print media interviews. In her painting, Jackie combines abstract and figurative elements using mixed media and collage. Her work is often uh, inspired by memories and moments captured through photography and film, but is then infused with her creative imaginings and exploration of materials and surfaces. Hello, Jackie. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so let's, Jackie and I are gonna do a little Q&A here to start. So we'll start with the subject of juring shows because the reason we wanted Jackie to be here is she was the juror for our autumn juried show that's currently on exhibit. So what's it like for you in general, juring shows? Oh, well, that's a great question. Um, so I find juring shows really hard. Um, I love seeing all the variety of work, but then when it comes time to picking which ones get in, um, I gotta say, that's a hard thing to do because I'm the kind of person that wants everyone to get in and everyone to get first prize, but you can't do that. So um, it's like curating a show. Um, you know, in this particular show, we had a lot of submissions. There was, I think, 226 submissions. So um, unfortunately, it just had, you know, you just have to start looking at the work and just going with your gut and choosing work that just jumps out to me. So, um, you know, I do a first run through, I'll just look through all the images first um, and then go through a second and a third time and start kind of, you know, putting aside the ones that I, that are catching my eye visually or for some reason make me look closer. I have to like find out a little bit more about how it was made, um, you know, what the title is. Um, so once I start, you know, finding images that I find to be interesting um, or different or unusual or just, you know, whatever it is that's catching my eye, um, I'll start pulling those images aside. And for this show, I was noticing that I was separating out things that I felt like I maybe have never seen before or I haven't seen or were unusual, different, unique, um, and, and had processes that were maybe um, a little bit mysterious or curious to me. So that tends to be what my particular taste in art is. Um, and I think, you know, for any, anyone who's putting work in a juried show, they know that the juror is gonna like things that, that maybe appeal to their own style of making art. I try to be um, cognizant of really paying attention and, and like um, just really giving every work of art the time that it deserves. Um, because I know as an artist and someone who also submits works to juried shows as well, or have in, in the past or often putting in things for uh, competitions of getting into residencies. And so, you know, it's, you never know if you're gonna get selected or not. And, um, you know, I try not to take it personally. So my message to everyone who put work in that didn't get in, it's not because anybody's work is not good. It's all great. I think my personal opinion is if you make it to your studio and you make art, then you have, then that's, that's all you need to do. Everyone's a winner just for showing up. So beyond that, I just kept on um, really just paying attention to the work in detail and um, picking out the works to me that were uh, a little surprising. I noticed that for me, I was, I was selecting works that um, I was like, maybe I have never seen before. Um, so a little unusual, a little different, um, that shows some personality. And that's kind of how I pulled this show together and um, 
And then of course, when it comes to the actual show, once the work is hung and on the walls and I had a day there to go and select and do that other second tier of jurying, um, then it's a whole different experience. It's like starting all over again. Um, you're seeing the work in the flesh and it's very different than seeing work online. And I've never really been a fan of looking at work online. It's very different than seeing it in person. Um, so I might've missed works that maybe were not well represented in, um, in a digital format. Um, anyway, once, once I got to the gallery and saw the show, um, which is so exciting, it was so fun, especially now coming out of this, you know, <laughs> but we're still living in this pandemic. Um, I really miss seeing art in the flesh. And so it was such a treat to spend the day um, in the museum and really just taking my time with the work. And that was even harder. It's even harder to pick best of anything. I find that tip really challenging. And I'm sure you would all feel the same way. It's like, oh, I like them all. I like them all for different reasons. I wish I could get everyone a prize. And I'm like that with my kids too. I never want to, <laughs> I never want to favor one or over another. So. That's hard for me to do that, um, but I, you know, but I did. I had to make some choices because that's what that's what we do, and in, uh, in, in the art world, we have these these competitions, and um, yeah. So that's those those are how my selection process. That's how my selection process went for this show. Well, it turns out it's just an extraordinary show. I mean, it's just it's so interesting. It really it's so colorful. It has, as you said, a really a lot of unusual pieces, uh, pieces with unusual processes behind mm -hmm. them. And um, so I encourage everyone to come see the show. It is up here in person at the Art Center for another uh, week or so. It comes down actually a week from tomorrow. Uh, so we hope people will come in and see it while it's still up this week. We are open every day. Um, so stop by. My, my bragging point during the pandemic is we're never crowded. So it wouldn't normally be my bragging point, but um, it is a very nice place to come and you often have the room to yourself. So we encourage everyone to come down here for that. Um, the second part of this with Jackie is to look at her piece in the show. We always invite the jurors to uh, bring us a piece that we put on the wall. Um, when you enter the show, it's on the wall on the left. And so I'm gonna go ahead and bring that piece up and Jackie, you can maybe tell us a little bit about that. I'm gonna share the screen now and uh, bring up that piece. Let's see if we can do this here. Okay. Okay, it's small on my screen. I don't know if you're able to zoom in on it at all, but mm. um, that, so that's, a, that's painting is um, acrylic and oil. Uh, the process for making that one, oh, and the size of it, how big is it? It's like, i um, thinking 42 inches, maybe by 30, 30 by 40, somewhere around there. Um, and this piece was based off of a photograph of my mother um, who uh, is in a canoe, she's paddling. And I use that as a starting point, but whenever I'm starting a painting, I'm, I'm often like keep, I have, sometimes I have a loose idea of where I'm going with the work. Sometimes I don't know what I'm doing at all. Um, and I don't really want to set up, uh, have a set plan. I just start putting paint down um, on the canvas or whatever surface I'm working on. I start moving paint, you know, paint around in colors until, until I start to see something in the work, something that seems familiar. Um, and in this case, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember, you know, once you get, get to the end of a painting working this way, it's often hard for me to remember a couple years later how I started a painting. So this painting is a few years old. It uh, made it in 2016, I, I believe. So, um, or maybe, yeah, I think around that time. So now I'm trying to remember what I did first. <laughs> and from what I remember, I think I had already started a painting. Um, moving it around, I turn it upside down and sideways and put it on the floor and dribble paint and pour things and just get, I get the surface activated. Um, and then I found a way to, to place this image or I was starting to conjure up a memory of a picture that I remembered of my mother. And I went and found the picture and felt like she really belonged in this landscape of abstraction. 
Um, and then I, you know, sketched her in and started to pull out the shape of the figure in this world of abstraction. And then, and then from that point on, it becomes this process of, of editing where I'm just kind of carving out shapes, um, editing colors and um, trying to pull it together as much as I can until I feel satisfied uh, with the end result. And that's how this painting came to life. And Jackie, I think I can get a little bigger. So I'm going to just um, do that for a moment here of try to get that picture a little bit bigger for a quick look again. And um, let's see here, let's see if we can try to get that a little bit. Well, while you're doing that, I can explain the beginnings. I work in acrylic and I use, um, often we'll use high flow acrylic paints. And then um, at the end, I really only use oil paints towards the end if I'm having to do some detail work or blending work. So in this one, the figure, I think I did, I did that in oil on top of um, mostly that acrylic sp splashy transparent background. So yeah, it's still small, it's but that's okay. Small. That's fine. <laughs> well, what, get, what's good, the idea. Jack, Jackie's paintings are very large and you get a feeling for that from looking in her studio. <laughs> so, we can, so we can move to that next. Okay. All right, so when I'm, gonna, I'm gonna turn the camera around. You get a close up of my fingers. <laughs> Sorry, okay. You let me know. So this is my studio. Um, I'll start in my front door. Welcome to the studio. This is where I keep all my color charts and I just pin up things on this wall that that I like to reference on a regular basis. And so, you know, any sort of visual information and collection of stuff through the years that have added onto that wall. Um, I share the studio. I'm at Char Chalkboard Studio in Barnstable Village. Um, there's a, it's an old school house and there's 12 artists in the building. Um, and I share this space. I'll show you the windows. You can see I've got these beautiful north facing windows that overlook a cemetery. And I have two other people I share a studio with. I've got Abby Fay in this corner, James Wolf in this corner and then I have the other half of the room. So this is a view of my space here from the windows, my reading spot where I read and write, and then supplies, sketches. It's a mess. I was working recently. Um, so there's drawings here and my oil painting table, which is also a big mess. I'm not one of those organized kinds of people. I keep things. Uh, yeah, like this. <laughs> That's the way I work. And it works for me because oftentimes if it's too neat and tidy and I'm like looking for something, I can't find it. But in the mess, I'm able to sometimes find just the thing that I need. And on the wall here is a piece I'm working on. It's a triptych and it's uh, on fabric. I've been lately I really like working with a lot of different kinds of materials. I experiment with collage um, and drawing and painting. And uh, for a while I was working on aluminum and I still am, but I, I've put that aside, oops, put that aside right now um, uh, to focus on working for an upcoming show I have that is, um, it's not till June, but it's a solo show at the Art Complex Museum in Duxbury. So I'm, I'm working on large scale works for that show. And this piece is, um, is in process. So you're getting a sneak peek of things to come. Uh, here's up close detail of what, what I'm doing. I've got some, something referring to drawings and plans, and some figurative, some abstract. And what else can I show you? Over here by the windows, this is the, this will show you, I'll try not to go too fast and whip the camera around so you all get dizzy. Um, out here looking by the window. So this is an example of work on aluminum that I was doing for a while. These are based off of old family photographs. And here's an example of where I'll get my photos from. This is an album of my mother's 
you know, I've got actually, I have a lot of albums that I inherited recently and I've been using them to make these, uh, make these paintings. And this is the one that's, this is one that's on aluminum paneling. So it's shiny. Yeah, it's kind of hard to see. It's hard to hold my iPad and the artwork at the same time, <laughs> but there you go. That's a, a tour of the studio, the bookshelf. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I'm, I'm... Jackie, this was great. You know, it's it's funny. I know there are some people on the, the meeting tonight that were on the last one, and there was uh, one particular person who wanted to see a messy studio. So you have <laughs> made that person happy. But I know we love we all love seeing things in process. So this is really fun. Uh, Thank you so yeah. much. Any questions for Jackie while we're on Jen? There'll be time at the end as well. Um, anyone want to ask a question for Jackie? What kind of uh, fabric is she working on here? Uh, um, so I'm working actually, like I found this new material quite by accident. Um, it's actually just curtain liner material. So it's a very soft, um, like a cotton blend polyester uh, and it's um, I, it, I just have it in the huge rolls here I'm going to just grab some see up close so it's it's oh. a soft it's a soft fabric it's not like an official art material it's uh, mm. It's really, it's curtain liner. It's blackout curtain liner material. And I love it because the way it takes the acrylic paint, I use um, high flow acrylics. So it's very soft and it absorbs really nicely into the fabric. Yeah. Another, with it. thank you, Jackie. Another question we have is, can you show some of your painting tools? My painting tools, yeah, sure. Okay, so. Bring it over here. One of my favorites. Oops. <laughs> okay, here's one of my favorite painting tools. <laughs> ah, did I lose you? Um, you just need to click the video. There, there. We're, we're back. I'm sorry. I'm multitasking here. Okay, this is one of my favorite tools. It's a squeegee, a window washer, and I pull paint a lot because I like to use um, tools that are non traditional you know, as opposed to paint brushes. So I'll use stuff like this or little, little squeegees to pull paint. Um, and I've, you know, I squirt paint straight from the bottle, you know, just draw and pull. And then <laughs> this, is, this is like a kitchen show. And then a squirt bottle to water it down. And then I pull the paint with the squeegee. So I, I do like um, working with things that kind of remove my hand from the paint directly, um, just, to, just so that things are spilling and pouring and accidents will happen. I, my favorite thing is to work with accidents. So um, I'm, I'm very much a fan of just make something big, bold move and see, see what happens. And so by working with these kinds of tools, it gives me, I have a little less control and I like to start my paintings that way so that, and then later on I'll get more detailed and controlled and I'll pull out mm, fine tools and um, small brushes. But that's, you know, other, otherwise I'm, I'm using most of the basic kind of, you know, materials that everyone uses. All right, we've got another question for you. How does the setting of the studio affect your creative process? And I think he's referring to, um, in particular, does the cemetery have any effect? I think the ghosts are entering in my work all the time. If anyone of you know my work, um, I do have a lot of, uh, uh, I reference a lot of old photographs, which kind of feels like I'm conjuring people who aren't here. And uh, certainly when I draw these people from my own personal past, um, you know, it feels, it feels like these spirits are entering into the studio with me. So I often wonder about that, um, if, if I'm being influenced by the graveyard or, um, um, you know, or if it's just a part of who I am, but uh, who knows, you know, it is an old building and has a cool history. 
And uh, I'm sure there's people who are, are here, a lot of ghosts in this building. But other than that, I am inspired by the light in the studio because we have a beautiful north facing windows that are very uh, tall and it's bright, the whole side north facing, it's just gorgeous. So um, I think the color palette of my work reflects the weather of what's going on. So I notice in the winter time, like this time of year, I start getting into grays and blues and blacks and you know a very sort of muted color palette and then come summertime, I can't help but be inspired by what's going on outside and the color palette gets brighter and um, changes, you know, changes with the seasons sometimes. So, yeah. There's a question and Linda Farmer asked this question. There might be a typo in the question. It says, is it, do you paint the fabric painting? Linda, what's your question? Do you something? Do, you, mo do you mount it? Oh, do you mount the oh. fabric paintings? Um, no, I don't. I actually am working on a large scale so that they can hang more like a tapestry. Um, I have some work up right now at Highfield Hall. If any of you are in that area, um, you can see what I've done there. It's, um, I've, I've only been working this with this material for the last, um, I'd say a year and a half now. So I'm still playing around with different ways that I'd like to display it. For now, the pieces that I have at Highfield are hung with a bar along the top on the back, um, kind of like you would hang a tapestry, but I didn't want to have a bar going through it, so it's attached. So I wanted it to feel like it was floating on the wall. Um, but these works, you know, they could also just be pinned or with a little grommet. Um, I'm going for a look that feels like a, um, an architecture, like a blueprint. So I'll probably be hanging these works that are in the background um, more like pinned up. So it's just a, um, that's just my personal preference and what I'm, what I'm looking to do. I did try stretching it. Um, it can be glued as well on surface. It's pretty versatile. I'm, I'm enjoying it, it's fun. And I like the way it absorbs the paint better than the, um, a canvas. Yeah. Thank you. Great. This is very, very interesting, Jackie. Thank you so much. <laughs> And um, we're, if you have more questions for Jackie, we can handle those at the end, but we're gonna move on to the next artist, which is Betsy Payne Cook. Betsy paints exclusively with pastels and is honored to be elected as a juried associate member of the Pastel Society of America and to have achieved signature membership status in the Pastel Painters Society of Cape Cod. Betsy is also acknowledged as a juried master artist at the Cape Cod Art Association. And here at the Falmouth Art Center, she's a popular teacher and also chairs our exhibition committee. Uh, Betsy's paintings depict her impressions of the landscape and its abundance of colors. She paints both en plein air and in her studio and conveys her love of the outdoors in each painting. Betsy, welcome. Oh, hello. This is fun being here. Uh, sharing my studio. I've got uh, enough space for me. So uh, what I've uh, done is I've set up the laptop so you'll get a view of the area of the studio where I do a lot of the, uh, the planning and then the other part of the studio where I do the painting. But before we get into that, what I've got is a progression so you can see uh, how I tackle the painting that is actually in the show. So let's pull this up. Oh, wow, that's a, uh, hmm. Well, that's a really, uh, that's a zoomed in version, which I'm not actually sure how it got zoomed in to tell you the truth. But anyway, okay. Here, let's, uh, I'm just gonna move you guys so that I've got a little bit more room over here on the side. And, okay. Okay, so I've been doing this, uh, here, let's try this. Okay, I've only been doing this for four months, everybody. <laughs> so, oh, goodness. So can we all see one image? Uh, yes, Betsy, we see the, the image and okay. the Zoom is, is nothing if not unpredictable, as we all know. So we, we right. do see Okay, so just, <laughs> oh, that's it. And you know, it's funny. This was the most challenging part of Zoom. 
And it wasn't until I think like the sixth week that I realized that I was doing the order of the buttons wrong. So uh, my brain sometimes just goes right back to that. Okay, uh, a lot of my uh, work uh, that I do in this studio does uh, result in uh, impressions of some place that I've been. And I do not copy the photographs. I use them as a jumping off point. So this was a, a wet evening in Glasgow in uh, Scotland. And what captured uh, my interest in this was really the contrasts of a very muted scene with some really bright colors and these figures that are walking across the, uh, the road. So with pastel, you can use a lot of different materials underneath. So this is actually a gator board. I prep it myself with gesso and pumice ground. And this was painted with a very light wash of acrylic ink. And I, the, the color was actually, this photograph's a little bit dulled out now that I'm looking at it. I put down just the general shapes because they're going to get painted over. I'm not going to stress out doing a whole load of details at this point. Then what I do is a variation on a no tan where I use the color that I put down to represent any areas that are light. I then take and I block in any areas that I want to fall in the darker value, uh, end of the value bar. And for this, I used a, a purple lake acrylic ink so that I've got areas that I can make a little bit darker. I can vary it, I can drag it through, I can change the direction of my mark. But before I've actually uh, added any pastel, I can actually look at the composition, see how the shapes are falling. Do I have any compositional faux pas? Uh, you know, is, is this going the way I want it to? I did this for a demo for uh, Yarmouth uh, Artist Guild. So I actually have a couple of the photographs in progress because I'm forever forgetting to take uh, photographs uh, uh, while I'm working. I did do two little uh, color studies, composition, just looking at it. And then, as I said to you, it really was the colors, that wet pavement, the figures that were crossing over. And I really felt as though this one here, although I like it, it it's kind of cut in half. So that part I have to deal with. This is the one that actually captured the essence of that scene. So I just reimagined recreated this, um, the, the composition, and I wound up adding the layers of the colors with pastel on top. And you can see I'm starting to add lighter, mid to lighter values are gonna go on this, and these guys will remain dark. And that was the finished painting. Um, the texture that you see in here is due to, and over here, it is due to the uh, textured surface that I create myself. And the last photo is me in the other room. I have two small rooms. This one's packed. I did do a slight uh, cleanup so I could walk around and take at least one photo of me. But I have, this is where I do all my prep work. I keep all my teaching work in there. Um, this is also uh, my business. This is the business center right here. <laughs> So I have an old kitchen counter on sawhorses that I used to do uh, all the prep work. I have these uh, great shelves that I bought that I can keep tons of stuff on, and I adjusted the, sh the shelving the way I wanted. It's also where I keep paintings so I can protect them. There's more over here. Um, so that's the room that I, I'm not going to take you in. So I'm going to take you into... This one, this, this, is, this is the painting end. This is not as messy as the other room. I'm not really a neat freak. Um, I did, when I sent out a notice for this, I did ask people if they wanted me to clean my studio up or not, and everybody said no. So, <laughs> so this is my, although I think Jackie, you do have me beat on that table with all this stuff, okay? Pastels, they can only just get so messy. So I have piles. <laughs> so anyway, let me, um, I just want to mention with the show, uh, you know what, Jack, there's really nothing more I can say to, uh, to what Jackie said. That was perfect. I mean, when you enter a jury show, you have to have thick skin. You need to know that 
even if your painting is good, it may not have gotten in just by the, you know, the, the parameters of the show. I mean, you could only have 40 odd paintings out of 200 some, you know, that's, that's quite a daunting task. And I applaud you, Jackie, <laughs> for the energy it probably took to go through everything and make those decisions because that, that is hard. Um, but a couple of things, if you are interested in uh, entering shows, I use a lot of organizers and um, I have uh, three different series that I work on and then my plein air is separate. So I keep running logs of my paintings and then for each painting, uh, this is a fairly new one, I keep a list of the shows that, whether they're juried or not, and whether I enter them, and who the judge is, because I don't want to enter, I'm not going to enter this painting in another show that Jackie's going to jury, because she's already seen it. So it's really important once you, you know, start entering shows that you, you keep good records, so that you don't enter at the same place or with the same jury. So I thought I would just show you a couple of things over here. This, uh, this is the area where I do all the planning. And I thought you'd be interested in the must-haves. So the must-haves is a comfortable chair with a pillow. I've got that. I've got my music. I'm all set. I've got portable light, the not light that I can move around. Um, and I have uh, everything here that I need to actually sketch. Uh, I do, uh, and this is the way I teach, I do a lot of prep work and I tell people I do the preliminary work so that when I paint, I'm free. I can just paint. I don't have to start thinking about colors, composition, all those other things because I'm going to let uh, the painting lead me through where I want to go. So I luckily have this great file folder with huge sheets of paper, but what I do This is always at the ready for uh, plein air. So I go plein air painting. I uh, have a couple different sizes and these are great organizers for uh, the papers that I cut from large sizes. And that can just go right out with me. These are some smaller samples of the boards that I paint on. And you can see this has got multiple textures and layers. And when I feel creative, but I don't feel as if I want to tackle a painting, I'll just work on boards. Maybe I have no idea what I'm going to do with them, but I'll just work on these different boards with textures and scraping and layering with uh, gesso, uh, acrylic inks, gouache, watercolors. Um, you can see this one here. Uh, this one, I've started something new. This is on birch wood. And uh, this is acrylic ink that's been sprayed and you get this lovely uh, bubbly effect, which really I think will go really nice with those underwater scenes that I do. So we'll see where that one winds up. And this here is a really good example of how you can see once you start dragging pastel over this very highly textured surface, how the layers go on in a response to the type of surface that you have there. So I can get this really unusual texture that appears and the closer the value the colors are, the less that that texture is going to show up. Um, and since I was telling you that I'm organized and we're over here, so you know what I do over here, I only use photographs as a jumping off point. Then the photo goes away. If you're someone who gets trapped in a photograph, at least use a black and white so you don't get trapped in the color. You know, you can expand. You don't feel as though you have to copy. I do a variety of sketches so that I can play around with the composition, the values. I write myself notes. I do close-ups. Uh, I have a, uh, this was done for a class, so I usually have my class painting smaller. So I write down the sizes. So if I want to do it larger at another time, I know what the proportions are. And actually, sometimes my notes are really funny because uh, sometimes I have no idea what I was saying to myself, but this, this one looks okay. I tend to do little color studies where I just play around with color and I use a swatch of the paper 
here so that I get a rough idea of what I'm going to translate into my first uh, uh, first pass at the uh, larger scale painting. So the must haves over here, like I said, is the comfort, the comfort zone. Uh, I do, pastel painters, uh, paintings need to be protected. So I tend to, the ones that I'm pleased with, I put in plastic sleeves, uh, you know, and they come in all different sizes so that I don't have to worry about them getting smeared. Pastel is a pure pigment. Uh, you know, it's just as uh, the longevity is just as much as a uh, good quality, you know, uh, oil paint. The problem is, is it does smear. So you do need to keep it protected. This is one where I talked, uh, I showed you how I had textures underneath. This has got a lot of stenciling and textures that I added on top. Again, this is a wash that's underneath. Uh, this one was not with acrylic inks. I believe it was just with pastel and alcohol. Because it's a pure pigment, as soon as you add water or alcohol to pastel, it turns into paint. Okay, so now we're going to turn it slightly. And this is, this is the painting side. <laughs> this is the painting side of my room. Okay. And uh, again, the, uh, the pastels, the, 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 the dust of the pastel is something where you need to be very aware of. And the first thing you can do to uh, reduce the amount of dust that's created is one, to use sanded boards or heavily textured boards. Because what will happen is, is those uh, surfaces will grip the pastel. We've all had that when we first start out with pastels, you, your pastel smears all over the paper, you get dust all over, and then inevitably somebody blows on it, where does it go? Into the air and you breathe it. So if you're using, imagine sandpaper, that you're painting on sandpaper, it grabs that pastel, I get very little dust that falls down here. Working upright helps, so I want to make sure I have an easel with enough uh, space where I can change my board. This is a 12 by 24. The largest I've gone so far is an 18 by 24. Um, I have an air purifier that I luckily got secondhand when um, uh, Jane Lincoln moved on from pastels, so I was happy to snag that. That's, uh, that's a, definitely a bonus. A uh, couple of uh, just uh, practical things to keep your pastels uh, clean. Um, I always have, these are variations of Swiffers and they're great. This one like this is attached right to the uh, area where I can clean my pastels. I just give them a little wipe over. These I keep actually on the board here. And this is just a large piece of plywood that we cut I duct tape the edges so I didn't get splinters and it's just lying on top of an old uh, butcher block, which is great. So I have shelves underneath, which is like piled with boxes and paper towels and whole loads of other things. Um, the other uh, must have in here was lighting. And um, although I've got lots of windows, there's also a fair amount of trees. And um, recently I, I you know, decided to splurge and get uh, lighting uh, that is overhead here. And I can adjust whether it's cool or warm and how uh, bright I want it. And it's made a huge difference for the easel because I wound, wind up having a wonderful amount of light. You saw me sitting over here, you know, it, my room can get really, well, I mean, today, no, no great shakes on the light uh, source, but uh, this has made a huge amount of difference having the, the lighting. I do read a lot and I love listening to art podcasts and I have a board up there that I just write down quotes that people, um, that just captures my attention. Uh, you know, it's, uh, always those reminders to trust yourself, uh, you know, to just uh, don't judge your, your work by anybody else's work. The fact, I mean, Jackie said that the, the fact that you're showing up and you're doing something, 
Um, and the pastels. I mean, you know, who can't love pastels? I mean, can you see them? I tried to set everything up so you could see them. So I, arra I arrange in my color family, which is different from my plein air box, which is totally arranged by uh, value. And um, I have light to dark and color families running this way with uh, vibrance and neutrals here. And I have all different types of pastels. Uh, I could not tell you what is my favorite pastel um, because I, I, I really like them all for very different reasons. You use a hard pastel for a different reason than you use a soft pastel. Uh, pastels, um, frequently, um, you know, I'll use uh, the uh, spray bottle. I, my favorite brushes are the fan brushes. These are all preliminary work that's underneath the pastel. And um, you can really do a lot of exploring. I did a 12-week class uh, with students this summer, and it really was about exploring what you could do with pastels. Um, so it is really a very versatile uh, medium. Um, this section over here, which I can't actually point the uh, camera to because all you'd be looking at is my door. <laughs> but right by the door is my plein air equipment. My easel stays in the car and I have a bag and I have a, a pastel box right here so that no excuses, everything's ready. I can just walk out the door and I am uh, ready to go paint. And I showed you that little carry case that I have that just comes with me too. So I have a variety of papers. So my studio depends on what the day's like. I'm either inside or outside. Um, I love the fall. That's my favorite uh, season to paint <laughs> outdoors, but I will paint uh, all seasons. I just wind up having to uh, dress differently uh, depending on where, where I'm going and uh, what I'm going to do. And I have a couple different plein air setups and a couple, uh, one of them in particular is a small setup that I take when I travel. Uh, can people see me? Cause I seem to, yeah. Just we, have someone's name up on the. No, we we can see you, Betsy, okay. and we do have a couple of questions, so <laughs> I'll I'll give you those. Um, so uh, Lisa Daigle writes, Liz Hayward Sullivan, who you know, wrote in her recent newsletter that people shouldn't re-enter a pastel once it's been in a show, otherwise viewers don't find shows to be fresh. I agree in that I sometimes wonder if I have already seen a show because it has so many pastels from a previous show. Interested in hearing your perspective. Yeah, you know what? That's, that's, very, that's very true, which is one reason why I keep those organizers. Um, you know, if I am going to repeat uh, a painting in uh, you know, one of the national pastel shows, uh, what I try to do is give a, a breath of time in between it. Uh, on occasion, I will enter one painting in twice a year, but usually I stretch it out. The requirements on that is for three years tops anyway. The majority of uh, national and international pastel shows uh, limit it to a three-year-old painting anyway. So yeah, no, I agree. And actually, funny that you mentioned Liz Haywood Sullivan because my organizers are from Liz's uh, Art Smart class that I took, uh, which was absolutely fabulous. Mm -hmm. It was the business side of art. Okay. And so we have yes, great, great question, Lisa. We no. have an, <laughs> another question here is uh, did you use a tool to do the textured lines in your painting? Okay, uh, yes, those textured lines are actually, um, when, I, when I'm working on the board, I uh, hang, uh, the texture comes from applying the gesso and the pumice ground and then the pastel lies on that. And because of the, I'm exaggerating the grooves of the brush mark, I get different types of texture. So if I was using a brush that was very smooth, I wouldn't have uh, deep textural uh, grooves. I like hanging on to these old grotty brushes that most people throw out that some of times they're all stuck together. And I wind up with these wonderful ridges underneath. 
So it depends on what I'm, uh, what I'm doing. I'll also take and splatter my underwater series. I do a lot of splattering of uh, gesso uh, on the, the board so that I wind up with a different type of texture or spraying it or flicking it or anything like that. Okay, and we have another question. What kind of easel or tripod do you use when plein air painting? Okay, I have two. Uh, the, my uh, favorite one is the Take It Easel. Uh, if people are familiar with Rosalie Nadu, uh, her son Tobin, that is the easel that, his, uh, that he makes. And uh, you can purchase that online. There are knockoffs of it on, um, you know, uh, on the internet, but if I were you, I'd just go straight to, to Tobin. Uh, the quality is fabulous, and they're patterned after the Gloucester easel that was used predominantly in the late 1800s uh, by the uh, painters that would uh, frequent the area of Gloucester. Um, the other easel I have is a, a, a tripod. That's because these boxes that I have have a little screw hole here so that when I open it up, I can actually attach this right to a tripod. Um, not this one, this is my uh, one that I use with the Take It Easel, but the smaller one, which I'm actually using as a platform to put my, <laughs> put my laptop on so I can't show it to you. But uh, that one there, so I guess it's multi-purpose pastel box. Um, uh, that one's perfect for traveling because it's lightweight, it's small, you know, I just take a lot of half sticks because I take all the wrappers off uh, when they're new and I just uh, save the wrappers. So if sometime I really wanted to find a color, this is like one of those things where I think I'm being organized, but then I never actually follow through on it. So, but, but I have all the wrappers. <laughs> okay, any other questions for Betsy? And we can get, get back to her at the end as well, if you think of questions um, during the presentations. So thank you, Betsy, Hi, so Dave. much. Yeah. And we're going to now go to the, the third artist on our program tonight, Andrea Moore. Andrea is an artist and art educator working in numerous mediums. She lives part-time here in Falmouth and also in England, and you'll hear more about that in her presentation. But with the pandemic, we are happy to have her here in Falmouth year round. I have been admiring her printmaking skills and pieces in recent shows, and she received an honorable mention in the current autumn juried show. Uh, and in her presentation, you'll hear about lots of other mediums that she works in. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. Okay, this is actually where I'm sitting at the moment. <laughs> So this is my upstairs studio that stays fairly tidy, actually. Um, it's a little bit tidier than this at the moment. Um, and this is farther down from where I'm sitting. So I, I do oil paintings and have been working quite a lot gardening and the gardening has uh, kind of taken over my work. It, it, my work used to be abstract. All right, this is the actual start of my um, PowerPoint, which is a, the studio of Vanessa Bell. I saw a photograph of this when I was a teenager and I was very taken with it. Uh, Vanessa Bell, who is the sister of Virginia Woolf, this is her studio, which is in East Sussex, due south of London. So I always remembered this and I actually went to, I got to go there last July. And um, she built the studio on to a rented house. It was um, just off her bedroom. And I thought that was very impressive that if she woke up in the middle of the night, she could easily just go into her studio. The person who owned the house never uh, changed it. They, the people who lived there, Vanessa Bell and Duncan Grant and others, painted all over the walls and all over the furniture. Anyway, I thought I'd show that as my inspiration. 
Um, so here we go back again. I, I have this solarium, we call it, where I work in various parts of it, doing various things. On the table, my laptop right now is on that table. I can put my mat cutter on that. Up on the cart you see there is uh, a wood block I'm cutting for printmaking. There I tidied it up a little and I brought plants in from outside. The plants are very happy outside and they come in now this time of year a lot bigger than they were when they went out. This is in the basement the, um, for the woodworking that I do. The chop saw in the middle I got from a grant from the Falmouth Cultural Council probably 20 years ago. Um, and I also have to say anybody who knows my husband knows that he doesn't use these tools at all. They're definitely mine. <laughs> so this is the kind of work I do with wood. The, uh, these panels are six feet tall. Each panel is one foot wide and it's all these triangular shapes that I cut on the chop saw. And then this work was all in an exhibit I had at Highfield in 2017. So you can see the three dimensional component and the influence of my gardening. The one with the daisies and the peonies, a whole bunch of that is popping off the surface. So it's pieces of wood. This is my print in the show. It's called Acanthus Garden. And it was a series, it was from a series of prints using these stencils uh, that I cut from quilter's plastic that comes from Joanne Fabrics. Um, and I have to say in printmaking, once you get the ink out and you've made a big mess with ink, you, you wanna make quite a few prints. You don't wanna just plan to make one. And the first print is often definitely not the best. So this one was once I had um, done a few prints along the lines of what I, of my initial thought for this one, I was playing with my stencils and just throwing out the window the idea of making it um, super realistic. Um, so you can see the green and dark blue shapes are the acanthus flower. And you can see some, some white cosmos. And then the red are Stencils I used from another print, from other prints that I just added in for, for fun. So this is my flat file. The paper is um, 22 by 30. I like to use the whole sheet. I, I'm really not excited about doing small prints. So this is where I keep the paper that isn't printed yet. And I keep the prints that um, haven't been framed yet. This is a tray in my laundry room. The paper has to be um, damp to go to be printed. So I soak it in water. If I were standing in front of this tray, my, um, my utility sink is right at my right elbow. And that's how I put the water in and take the water out. And then I can blot the paper on top of my washing machine and my dryer. So then in the foreground, you see the press. This is my basement studio. Not super excited about being in there in the summer. This is a good studio at night. So I often find myself printing late into the night because again, once the ink is out, it's nice to just keep going with it because there's lots of cleanup. 
the press has this great wheel on it. So it's not a, um, you know, there's no motor. The, the wheel is what turns the, uh, press the press bed going under the roller. I got this um, craftsman drawers, which was quite a, uh, an indulgence, but just the idea of having drawers to put things away in. I, I gave it to myself for Christmas a couple of years ago. And then this is the bench that I use with a glass palette for the inks. So you can just imagine the colors of ink on it and the um, brayers and the palette knives and so on. This is the acanthus flower that's in our garden in England. Most people are probably familiar with the acanthus leaf, which is used in the um, capitals on columns in, in, in art history, but I don't know if there are many people who've actually seen the acanthus flower that has these spikes on it, the white petals, and then the larger pink petals. So at the start of this series, this was the first print that I made, and it was using a technique called trace monotype. Trace monotype, it doesn't use the press. It's the idea of rolling ink onto a plate, turning the paper upside down onto the plate, onto the ink and drawing on the back and the drawing will pick up the ink. It's, it's really a little crazy and a little bit daredevil in this case. So you see the plastic stencil on the left I used that to block out the um, area of the flower and I printed the background on the press. And then on the left, I rolled the color onto a plexiglass plate and that paper I flipped over. So it's making the carbon paper effect. This is another iteration um, this one was not trace monotype. This was completely made with the plastic stencils. Um, it's the 22 by 30 size and was in a juried show at the Cahoon Museum or the, uh, the Katuit Center for the Arts. Here's the leaf. This is a photograph of our acanthus plant. And there really are a few different types of acanthus. So you'll see some leaves that don't look quite as spiky as this. But I am fairly obsessed with the plant. And um, so I love looking at a photograph like this. And then I made some watercolor paintings of the leaves. That's on my kitchen counter. Um, so when I'm not doing oil paintings or the printmaking, I can be in my living room doing my needlework. And when I go to a needlework shop, I just love all of the colors and the way they have the, um, the threads displayed. So I made a little display for myself in my living room. And this painting behind it is by my dad who, who painted the Mississippi River and the skyline of Memphis, Tennessee where we lived for half of my childhood. And then this is one of those needlework pieces where I painted the, um, the lavender plant in the winter and then I stitched the design. So I use the watercolor for reference as I'm stitching. This is the bird's nest fern, one of my house plants. And then I put, it was, you know, as if I cut the leaf off and put lichen behind it. And then I made a bunch of these into small sculptures where they're glued on to stone. 
This is actually a, a roof tile from the Cotswold limestone. This was a photograph of, sent by a friend who grew these violas, sent me the photograph and I made a watercolor and then the stitching. And then just to end, I wanted to show this wonderful collection of heart-shaped rocks, which were given to me by a friend. And I made this photograph just thinking about people who are affected by the pandemic. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Andrea. And if you can just end the screen share, um, clicking on the red, we'll be back to seeing up at the top of the screen. Okay. There you go. We're back. That was amazing. And I'm sure people have questions for Andrea. Um, so many different things there to look at and different ways to be creative. Um, questions, calling for questions from people for Andrea. Um, I see the first one has come in. What size press and what make? It's a French tool press and it's, you know, it fits a full size piece of printing paper, so that's 22 by 30. And someone recently gave me slightly larger paper. It's too wide and too long for the press bed. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, that was from Mickey Lovett, who is a, a printmaker as well. Um, any other questions for Andrea? Questions on all the, the printmaking? woodworking, fiber arts, painting, <laughs> she's doing it all. Um, and we can take questions um, and thank you so much, Andrea. I'm sure some, some questions might come in as people are, are mulling it over. Um, we can also have questions for any of the other artists now as well. Um, these were just all such interesting presentations. My mind is just swimming with all these wonderful visuals we've seen here of people's studios. Here come some um, questions. Uh, Andrea, do you mind moving between the spaces or is it conducive to the different processes? Yeah, it really works out very well because in the um, upstairs studio, um, the, the light is great during the day, but I think about uh, reading about Georgia O'Keeffe who didn't want anyone to interrupt her during the day when the light was good. Because at night in the upstairs studio, you know, I don't like working with um, um, artificial light. Whereas downstairs in, the, in that studio, I can easily work with wood. And I, I do have very good lighting down there but it's not the same as this natural light. Here's another question. How did you learn how to use power tools? Um, I went to Washington University in St. Louis and I um, had been drawing and painting my whole childhood, definitely um, encouraged by my parents. And so as soon as I got to the uh, School of Fine Arts at Washington University, I immediately wanted to do everything that I had never done before. I actually had done some printmaking. Um, so I do have a print hanging in my house that I made, you know, as a teenager, but I did ceramics. I, I just loved the wood shop. The wood shop, I just, it was to totally die for. And so, you know, I started out by making stretchers for paintings. And then I was like, forget this. I've already done all of this painting. I'm going to try other things. So I have a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in sculpture and I worked with steel. So, you know, the way I learned was through the TAs. The professors were not teaching us how to use the equipment. The TAs were. 
So that that's how I learned. Great. I'm sure we're all envious that you know how to use all those things. <laughs> um, any other questions for Andrea or questions for Betsy or Jackie? This I've gotten some nice uh, messages of people saying what an awesome evening this has been. It certainly has been. Um, but any other questions before we sign off? I know we have certainly a lot to think about that we've seen tonight, um, but feel free to ask any other questions now, if you have any for any of the artists. Um, well, I, I don't see any. So those were three extraordinary presentations. I thank you all so much, Andrea, Betsy, and Jackie. Thank you so much for sharing your, your art with us and your studios and your wonderful uh, making uh, that you do. And um, we just appreciate it so much. I know we've all learned a lot from it. So um, we'll be having these tours of studios every month for our virtual art reception. So I hope you all will join us next month in November. I haven't scheduled it yet, but I'll put it out in the e-news when we get that scheduling done. It always features artists who are up in the galleries. Um, and so you can come to the galleries and um, see the, the artwork here that you, that you saw um, in the studios. And we hope we will see you soon. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming. We had over 40 people here um, at one point tonight. So we just appreciate all the, the interest and support. And thank you again to the artists for sharing your studios with us. So take care, everyone. Thank you for coming. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you Bye. all. Thank mm -hmm. you, Andrea. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you all for coming. Have a good night.